Okay, so again, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us. Thank you again for joining us uh, here in our first uh, session on this webinar series on uh, water utilities operation uh, that we are doing with my NILAD, uh Water Academy. So to start with our uh, uh, webinar, so since this is our first session, we'd like to kick this off with some opening remarks from some uh, uh, invited colleagues and guests also. So to start with, I'd like to uh, invite the current director of the Urban Development Water and Sanitation Division of ADB's uh, Pacific Division, Ms. Jingmin Wan, to give her opening remarks. Jingmin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jing. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, we all know that uh, ADB Urban Sector Portfolio commitment has uh, averaged around $2 billion annually since uh, 2010. Uh, in that, uh, about two thirds, in fact, are on urban water supply and wastewater management. And then in our Pacific region, in the 14 small uh, Pacific island countries, uh, water and wastewater projects are dominant. Uh, they are more than 80% of the total ADB investment. Uh, we can really see uh, the need to help to develop these capacities of uh, both our ADB colleagues and the DMC counterparts, not only in the project design and implementation of water supply and wastewater project, but also in operations and maintenance uh, for the sustainability and also specifically in this pandemic time, there is a higher demand for the water supply uh, for domestic purpose and also for um, you know, washing your hand, maintain the hygiene requirement. Uh, since 2017, the urban sector group has uh, partners with uh, Manila uh, in delivering five batches of uh, water utility operations training for ADB staff and also two trainings uh, uh, for DMC counterparts in Bangladesh and uh, um, Pakistan. Uh, besides these trainings, uh, Manila has also been one of uh, our mentor utilities under this uh, Water Operations uh, Partnership Program, or WOPS, uh, which aims to develop the management capacities of our water utility opera operators uh, in the region uh, through our training program and also um, with other uh, practice to help to improve their, their capacity. Specifically, I personally attended this uh, whole program of the water supply operation uh, trainings by Manila Water uh, um, Academy. Um, I really found it was very practical and comprehensive. Specifically, all these lectures, they are experienced practitioners themselves. So they have very rich practical experience uh, and also very clear picture. And, uh, when you listen to their lectures and also they are answering the questions, you can see they have the real know-how. So I'm very glad to see the opening of this uh, Manila Water webinar series today. Uh, I'm sure this would provide a very timely support in this pandemic time. In this uh, webinar series, uh, we look forward to learning from uh, Manila uh, experience. Uh, as a whole community, that's the best thing. Um, today, we, we, let's uh, start for, from their successful story in how they managed to reduce the high non-revenue water uh, to an acceptable level. We also look forward to learning more in the following sessions um, on other success stories on DMA management and wastewater management. All these topics would uh, um, help to strengthen our capacities, not only in the design implementation, but also their operation and the maintenance of the project. Uh, therefore, on behalf of uh, ADB and the Water Sector Group, let me thank Manila Water Academy, uh, led by their executive director, Ms. Uh, Rodoro, Rodoro um, Gambo. I hope I have pronounced your name correctly for a very fruitful partnership uh, that has led to very valuable learning for our staff and the DMC partners. 
uh, on all different perspectives of water utility management. So look, look forward to a very fruitful and exciting discussion in this uh, webinar series. Thank you very much. I hand it uh, back to Aljin. And by the way, I'm very happy to see you again, uh, Ms. Rodoro. After that training, I had very, very uh, impressed uh, uh, memory of a uh, whole training. Thank you. Thank you, Jingmin, for those opening remarks. And also to give us uh, um, opening remarks and welcome remarks on behalf of uh, the Manila Water Group. So I'd like to call now the Executive Director of Manila Water Academy, Ms. Rodora Gombola. Ms. Dora? Yeah. Thank you very much, Aldrin. And a uh, pleasant day to all. Director Jingmin, I'm very, very glad to see you again uh, after our training last, last year. And indeed, you were very, very much involved in the training and very much engaged. And this encouraged us to do more for, for ADB. Uh, I welcome all the officers and staff of ADB and the participants of this webinar. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to this knowledge sharing session of Manila Water Academy. The Academy's uh, aim is to help advance the water industry by spreading technical knowledge and promoting exchange of best practices. We have since helped our local and foreign counterparts, as I, Jingmin mentioned earlier, through capacity building benchmarking activities. And our trainings focus on non-revenue water, water supply operations, wastewater management systems, water operations, commercial practices, among others. Though most of our clients are from the water sector, such as the water districts and the water service providers, we also cater to the academe, the government, especially the local government units, and other interested individuals and organizations. And we thank ADB for being our capacity building partner for many years now through trainings and plant facilities visits, cleaning and water operators partnership for the WOPS program. As you may already know, water and wastewater services in Metro Manila has long been provided by the Metropolitan Water Works and Sewerage System or MWSS. In 1997, the operations of MWSS were privatized and one of the private concessionaires is Pineland. However, due to the Asian financial crisis, depreciation against the US dollar, the drought or the El Nino in 1998, and some regulatory issues, Manila was not able to comply with its service obligation despite its debt and capital restructuring in 2005. It is for this reason that MWSS took over the operations and bid out its shares in 2006. The new owners took over in 2007. This session will be about Manila's transformation since 2007 and how the non-revenue water reduction strategy enhanced its operation to improve access to water. Manila has had its share of operational issues due to the emerging challenges of the times. However, with the investment of technology, people and systems, it is able to fulfill and meet its service obligations as stated in the concession agreement. Our speaker, Ryan Hamora, who will be properly introduced later, is one of the first persons whom I had exciting working relationship when we were developing the NRW modules way back in 2012. Though module development was not part of this job description at the time, as an NRW technical practitioner, I saw in him the passion of NRW reduction in sharing his experiences, not only to his team and other Manila employees, but also to the entire water industry. Given that, I hope that you will all learn from this session and have an enjoyable and fruitful day ahead. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to whatever you are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dora, for your introduction and your opening remarks. Uh, also a brief introduction to my And now, uh, before we begin with our presentations, just like to remind, we have now 47 participants in the room. So if you have uh, to help us facilitate your questions, we like to inform everybody you can use the Q&A uh, button or the Q&A box. So you, there's a Q&A icon in the bottom of your screen, so you should be able to see that. So click that if you have any questions, just 
place your questions there so you can better facilitate the q a later on so you can actually place your questions even as the uh presentations are going to go in then we'll go through them one by one later on so uh, to go to our uh, presentation today so our speaker has almost 20 years of uh, professional experience in the water industry and uh, since 2002 he has played a significant role in strategic and water supply optimization managing and improving non-revenue water within Manila's concession area in 2011 under his role as head of nrw analysis department the company was able to deliver 500 million liters per day reduction in water lo water losses in 2012 he was promoted as head of central nrw divisions engineering and construction department taking on the responsibility of the design cost estimate tendering project management and construction supervision of all NRW related projects and maintenance and repair work with a cumulative cost of over $400 million in projects implemented until last year in 2020. At present, he is the head and senior assistant vice president of Mynila Central NRW Management Division. So colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker for the day, Mr. Ryan Hamora. Mr. Ryan? Do. Thanks, Adrian. Let me just share my deck. Adrian, can you kindly confirm if it's visible now? Yep, yeah, we can see your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me proceed. So again, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone's well and okay, uh, despite of the persistent challenges that we have right now because of the pandemic. Uh, maybe just to share as well, uh, here at Metro Manila, uh, in the next two weeks, beginning Friday, uh, the government will start imposing another enhanced community lockdown. Uh, this is to curb uh, the curb and control the spread of COVID. Uh, so we want to stay ahead of uh, the situation. So the government will be imposing that. Uh, despite despite of the challenges, uh, at least for this morning, let me uh, let allow us to share something uh, positive. So uh, for this morning, we'll cover Mynilad's NRW experience, uh, specifically how it's kind of a transition uh, or transformation where a challenge such as NRW was approached as part of an opportunity that enabled us to turn the situation around. So let me move on now to my presentation. So for this morning, uh, we'll cover uh, Mynilad's NRW journey uh, from the start of reprivatization back in 2007 uh, up to the present situation, uh, where we've seen a significant contribution of our NRW management program to allow that uh, allowed us or enabled us to improve our services to our customers. And also partly we'll cover uh, and highlight uh, some of the improvements we've adopted to turn the situation around. So let me begin by uh, giving a brief background of my NILAD. We are so at Maynilad, we're actually the largest private water utility uh, operator in the Philippines. We have a customer uh, count of 1.47 million uh, and we're owned and operated by two of the top uh, company here in the country, Metro Pacific and DMCI. And in 2013, uh, we were joined by Marubeni. In terms of uh, the details of our uh, uh, company, uh, company profile, so we cover 17 cities and municipalities in Metro Manila and portion of Cavite, uh, serving a total population of close to 10 million. Uh, we operate uh, over 7,500 uh, kilometers of pipe networks, including 24 uh, pump system and 23 reservoir. Our customer profile uh, is 8% uh, of our customer are non-domestic and 92% is domestic, but in terms of the revenue, as you can see here, 51% of our revenue actually comes from 8% of uh, our customer in the non-domestic segment. So uh, because of this, we actually have a dedicated team uh, under our key accounts group that focuses on uh, providing uh, services or attending to the needs of our non-domestic customer because uh, they essentially uh, are the driver of our revenue. Now, moving on, uh, that's a company for a profile. Uh, let me just, uh, this is actually a critical part of uh, where we come from or our situation back in 2007. 
So a brief background on uh, our situation prior to uh, pre uh, prior to the reprivatization. So back then in 2007, uh, our NRW level was already at 66%. Technically, uh, before uh, at, the, at the first privatization back in 1997, we, we were also around that figure. We, we had an NRW of about 67%. So uh, from 1997 to 2007, there wasn't really a significant improvement in terms of NRW. Uh, as Dora mentioned, there were several challenges faced by the previous operators. Uh, which essentially is something that we had to continue taking on when the new owners stepped in in 2007. So we were losing about 1,500 million liters of water per day. Uh, when we run our water balance to do an initial assessment of a baseline of what the problems were, we were able to determine that 75% of our NRW actually came from physical losses, primarily because of the age and the conditions of our pipe network. So back then, at, at the onset, I think we were operating uh, around 6,000 6, kilometers of pipe network uh, back in 2007. And as a, as a consequence of that high NRW, we had very poor service level. Uh, we were only able to provide 50% uh, uh, of uh, what continuous water availability to our customers. So the other 50% suffered from intermittent, uh, intermittent water availability and uh, very low pressure in the system. Uh, because of the limitation as well of uh, our NRW or water losses in the system, we, were, uh, we had very low service coverage. So at the onset, about 2 million people uh, had no access uh, to, to our water uh, because of the problem again, uh, due to our uh, NRW or water losses. So that was the situation at the start. Uh, just to give context so that you have a better appreciation of the amount of uh, water loss that we're talking about. Uh, in Maynilad, in 2007, we were operating two uh, major uh, treatment plants. Treatment plant one, both in La Mesa, uh, in Quezon City. Treatment plant one uh, had the capacity to treat 1,500 mld of water. Uh, treatment plan two uh, had a capacity of 900 MLD. So as you can see, all of the water that we were producing in treatment plant one, which, is, which was the bigger plant, was actually equivalent to the amount of water that we were losing in the system. So that's essentially, uh, that's a very critical uh, point uh, that uh, that segment of uh, our uh, operation back then in 2007, because uh, we were only making use of 900 MLD, uh, getting revenues from that, and uh, the, the output of the entire treatment plant one was just completely lost. So to, to give a better context, if, if you haven't had the chance to visit La Mesa treatment plant one and two, uh, of how, how huge or how, how challenging really the situation was, the volume of water loss uh, equivalent to 1,500 MLD can actually fill, fill up about 600 Olympic-sized swimming pools every day. So every day you can refill uh, 600 Olympic size swimming pool. So this is actually quite relevant now because of the ongoing uh, Tokyo Olympics. Uh, so if you can just imagine that amount of challenge that we were dealing with back in 2007. So daily, that's, that's the daily volume of what we were losing. So it was really a big, big challenge for us. But in essence, that challenge also, uh, as the new owners took over, became an opportunity. Uh, they were able to realize early on that the amount of water that we were using, even if we're able to just save 50% of that, we'd be able to improve the services of our customers who were underserved and uh, expand our services to those whom uh, we have not yet served. So majority of those are actually in the South and some pockets of uh, unserved populations in the Northern area of Manila. So areas in Taloocan, and areas in Cavite. So those are uh, the, the those are where majority of our unserved uh, communities uh, lay. So again, the challenge uh, of introducing NRW was also a big opportunity for 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 the new management. So it was an opportunity that we clearly leveraged on because uh, part of our strategy was really to recover that volume. So in terms of developing the framework of what we wanted to achieve initially as under, on, 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 an organization, uh, we, we knew that uh, we had to uh, adopt solutions that were both 
cost effective and sustainable. So part of the framework or the priorities that we focus on were capacity building. So uh, we had to invest on uh, ensuring that our people uh, were competent to operate and to sustain whatever gains will, that will be achieved. We also invested in new technologies and equipment uh, as well as uh, something critical, the data management system that we've also adopted and continuous process in the improvement of our uh, facilities. So uh, we had to make sure that these framework were carried on through whatever programs that we will uh, need to adapt because this will guarantee the sustainability and success of the program itself. So as part of uh, the solution uh, in terms of our approach on NRW, it was actually very clear as well at the onset that because of the size of the network of Magnilad, so as I mentioned earlier, back then we were operating at about 6,000 kilometers, now it's 7,500, but there was really a need to break down that system or that network into more manageable systems. So at the onset, we had uh, the Magnilad, uh, the entire distribution network, we subdivided it into hydraulic system. So of the entire network, we were able to come up with 140 hydraulic system. Uh, but we had to further trim that down and localize uh, the issue. Uh, so we had to establish DMAs or district metered areas. So this is also part of the benchmark and the consultations we did with uh, interna recognized international NRW experts uh, in terms of crafting the technologies and alignment of the different NRW components. But this really is where uh, we concentrated at the onset because uh, there was a clear need to subdivide the network to make sure that uh, each area at the DMA level is isolated so that we can address uh, the problems accordingly so that we're not, we're not just doing shotgun approach. Uh, we had to make appropriate solutions for uh, and match them with the, with the needed, uh, uh, with the needed uh, solution to address the given problems. Now to further add to that, so that's a key item that we did. Uh, we broke down the system and, broke, uh, and, and trimmed them down up to the DMA level, but there are other significant uh, program components that we had to take on, that we had to implement in parallel while we were doing DMA establishment. Uh, so these are some of them. Let me just go briefly uh, uh, on each of them. So water audit or water balance as we call them, uh, is uh, essentially the process or uh, where we build uh, initial information or we conduct baseline measurement and assessment of what the situations are in terms of NRW, in terms of how we need to operate the system better. So uh, that's an integral component of the program, uh, conducting water audit and water balance to develop baseline and to identify what the, what the needed solutions are. So per DMA, uh, for every DMA, we had to develop a water balance to identify whether we needed to approach uh, it using uh, solutions intended for addressing physical loss or uh, do we need to focus on commercial losses? So for each of the DMAs, we had to make that distinction and water audit and water balance was very critical to that. And as I mentioned earlier, DMA establishment, uh, we, we, had, we, we, we needed to establish DMAs and at the end we were able to establish I think 1,600 DMAs across the entire network. Uh, the third component of the program actually, uh, at the onset, there, this was really part of our major challenge because active leakage control, uh, we were treating it as just uh, sort of something that we, need to, we needed to comply with. But uh, as we conducted benchmarking and we conducted consultations on how to approach it better, we recognized how it was very critical to make the distinction and measure uh, exactly uh, how to improve awareness to location of the leak, to repair, to continuous monitoring. So the term is ALRM. Uh, so we had to measure uh, the leaks uh, and our repair uh, according to those components so that we can break them down and identify uh, where the problems really uh, happen. Is it, in the, is it in the awareness? Is it in the localization? Is it in the repair time? Uh, so uh, you have to break that down to achieve uh, a good program for active leakage control so that you can address the program effectively. I guess just to, just, uh, just to further uh, drill down to do that ALRM, for our case in Maynilad, uh, the biggest challenge was the, in the actual repair because uh, 
when we had to do leak repairs, uh, we actually had to secure on the average around five different for permits from the uh, different uh, government units uh, assigned to specific areas. So imagine five permits. So uh, as we were, as we became more aware of that challenge, we were able to do more coordination with the concerned government units until we were able to trim that down to manageable level. So that was a very critical step uh, in the active leakage control program, wherein you identify exactly where the where the challenges are so that you can address them accordingly. So that's it more or less about active leakage control. Uh, the integrated meter management uh, is really about uh, having an integrated approach on how you deal with the selection, with the shortlisting, with the procurement and maintenance of meters. So back then, uh, those different activities related to meter were undertaken by different uh, units in the, in the company. So we had to integrate all those functions to make sure that we have a consolidated approach that was cohesive and really attended to the requirements in terms of meter management and control. Uh, the next component, the selective uh, pipe replacement program, because of the age of our network, so uh, this initially was already part of uh, our arsenal in terms of addressing uh, NRW in the system. So we were uh, doing selective pipe replacement uh, based on certain criteria. Again, uh, this required that the DMAs had to be established so that we have a clear measurement. Uh, that we, we needed to address physical loss. And then uh, we, in terms of uh, identifying those candidates for selective pipe replacement, uh, at the onset, we identified specific criteria or parameters, like say, for example, uh, the volume of water loss, its proximity to the major pump system, uh, also if it will contribute to improving the service level or our, uh, meeting our service obligation to our customers, or uh, number one, actually, if there's a water quality concern, so immediately, uh, if, if, if uh, it will fall on that criteria as well, uh, we have that option to conduct selective pipe replacement as well. So those are just some of the criteria that we put in place to make uh, the selective pipe process, uh, pipe replacement process more efficient. Uh, the next component, the pressure management, actually has to be really aligned with uh, the other two components, hydraulic modeling and data management system. So uh, pressure management, including those other uh, program components, also had to be uh, worked on in parallel in DMA establishment, so that you have to go don't uh, so that you don't have to go back and forth uh, in establishing DMAs. You already have to make that consideration in terms of what the efficient uh, where the efficient source would be. So you would need hydraulic modeling and data management system for that, and you would already consider how to make that area a pressure managed area. So that again, as I mentioned, you don't have to go back and forth. So when you design a DMA, all those things already have to be in place. Uh, that's also a way of optimizing uh, resources and investment. So that's just a general discussion on the NRW program components. Uh, so let me let me move on to after adopting all of those uh, NRW program components and implementing them for, for really a significant number of years. So uh, after 13 years, we were able to uh, reduce the 1,500 MLD. Uh, we were able to reduce 800 MLD of water. So we started at 66% and at the end of 2020, our total NRW for the DMAs was already at 26%. So uh, enabling us, again, to reduce a total of 881 ML, uh, MLD of water. And uh, as a result of that, we were able to provide uh, more uh, water to service our customers. So we were uh, able to improve the access of uh, reliable, clean, potable water to our customers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, only 50% were served properly. So by 2020, majority, close to 100%, already have uh, access to water 24 hours a day uh, at the minimum of 7 PSI pressure. So that's part of our obligation, actually, which we were able to achieve because of uh, uh, our NRW reduction efforts. So part of, the, uh, part of uh, the water that we were able to recover, we were able also to, we were also able to bring them down, uh, bring them to uh, our expansion areas uh, in the north and in the south. So we laid new pipes to convey and resell these water, and that allowed us to increase our service coverage from 
uh, roughly around 81% in 2007. Uh, now we're at about 94, 95% in terms of service coverage. So actually we were able to double the number of our service connection or customers. So we started at 700,000 back in 2007. Right now we have 1.47 million customers. So that's part of uh, uh, the achievement or the outcome of uh, the successful NRW program that we implemented. Financially, of course, this resulted to us being more viable uh, as we improve the service level and we uh, increase our service coverage to reach more of our customers. Our, uh, our uh, annual revenue actually more than doubled. So starting at 170 million back in 2007, uh, on the average, our, our revenue is already at 450. 4 million every year. So uh, with the available finances, we were able to support under, uh, other NRW uh, initiatives. So it's actually a cycle where you improve NRW, you have benefits from improved financial uh, uh, stability, and then you're able to rein, uh, reinvest those uh, additional revenue or additional finances to continue improving your system. So that's actually a very good cycle. Uh, to look forward to if you're, you plan on undertaking NRW program. In terms of capital expenditure, uh, we did spend significant amount uh, of CapEx on NRW deduction, but as you saw earlier, the returns were also uh, very significant. So we spent 574 million. This includes various components of the NRW program, including DMA establishment, pipe rehabilitation, uh, Purchasing of new leak detection equipment and new meters, uh, adapting new meter technologies, those, are, those all form parts of our expenses uh, when it comes to NRW reduction. So again, a few other significant accomplishments. Uh, we were able to establish 1,627 DMAs across the network. On the average, we were repairing more than 30,000 leaks every year. So in total, we've repaired 388,000 leaks already to date, uh, 2,866 kilometers replaced. Oh, these are uh, the old networks. And so far, uh, we've done replacement of meters uh, for over 1.5 million uh, instances. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, as we established DMAs, uh, in parallel to that, we were also establishing pressure management areas, so we were able to establish 1,437 pressure managed areas as well. So uh, with the pressure managed area, we were able to optimize uh, pressure and control of the network, extending life of the asset, and of course, having uh, resources, uh, optimizing our resources as well as our finances as well in terms of operation and maintenance. So when we talk about complete, complete turnaround, uh, turnaround of the situation from 2007 to, to present, so we started uh, off with having 66% uh, non-revenue water. So we were producing a lot, uh, but we were only able to sell uh, less of that water uh, of what we were producing. So right now, the turnaround is that uh, the situation has reversed. So we have more build volume right now than our level of NRW in the system. So we're able to produce less or we're able to produce similar amount of water, but we're able to sell more. So when we talk about turnaround, uh, you can see it clearly in the situation comparing 2007 versus our uh, present condition. Uh, at this point, uh, I'll cover some of the details of uh, the measures, the processes, and the systems we've adopted, enable, uh, uh, enabling us to deliver those NRW reduction. So again, uh, part of those includes capacity building, uh, technology process, and uh, establishing a data management system. So in terms of capacity building, uh, early on, there was a really clear understanding that in AIA, to allow us to make this program sustainable, we had to really invest on our people. So we conducted benchmark activities from uh, other water utilities uh, in, in uh, Thailand, Malaysia, even, even uh, further abroad to, to really uh, capture best practices. Uh, we also identified and worked with uh, experts, foreign experts and consultants 
to conduct trainings to our people uh, because uh, we really, uh, there was really a need to develop that competency and uh, to upskill our people to make sure that whatever program uh, on NRW reduction that we will be implementing will be sustainable. So it can be carried forward uh, and not just uh, be a one-time activity. So uh, aside from this, uh, in terms of timing, this was also very relevant because we partnered with our own Water Academy to, uh, as Dora mentioned er earlier, to institutionalize training programs related to NRW. So we had to make sure because we initially employed a lot of young engineers then that there was a continuous process in terms of uh, capacity building. So making sure that we always have a fresh supply of people who are competent, who are capable and who are engaged uh, to conduct NRW reduction work. So uh, this is properly aligned with the vision of our uh, Maynila Water Academy, uh, which is to be a world-class uh, center of excellence uh, when we talk about water sanitation and hygiene training uh, worldwide. Uh, in terms of uh, technology upgrading or uh, the new, uh, new technologies we've adopted, uh, initially, part of our competency was really to build on uh, the expertise of our people using basic leak detection equipment. So we're talking about just the normal uh, leak noise sounding equipment uh, that, that multiplies the sound of leaks to make it more audible to, to our engineers and to our uh, servicemen. So in 2008, we built on that competency and capacity, and then slowly we upgraded to new technologies. So uh, year on year, we adopted new systems. So 2009, we, have, we were using new noise loggers, and then 2010, uh, we adopted tethered leak, uh, leak inspection in, in, inside our pipes, and then uh, continuously adopting and uh, looking for new technologies that, that we had to test and we had to validate uh, in terms of being uh, compatible with how we operated our system and our network. So it's a continuous process. Even now, we still have ongoing developments in terms of our leak detection capabilities. But uh, our initial investment in 2008 remains very critical uh, because even right now, really the workhorse of our leak detection team, our majority of leak detection team, are those basic leak detection equipment. So. Uh, it was important to make sure that our teams were very competent and going back, there are continuous training to ensure that uh, they, they continue to develop that competency and improve on it. So as I also mentioned, uh, in 2010, we made use of the first Sahara in Asia. Uh, right now, we've already inspected more than 1,000 kilometers of our primary pipe network. So when we say primary pipe, net, pipe, pipe network, we're talking about uh, large pipe diameter, 400 millimeters and above. So uh, aside from the leaks and the illegal connections that we've detected, we were also able to identify anomalies in the pipe system, such as uh, obstruction in the, in the pipes because of, because of the age. Uh, there were some obstructions already in the network that limited the flow on the pipe. So we, we were able to identify those types of anomalies when we, when we conducted or when we implemented the Sahara system using a tethered leak, leak inspection uh, inside the, inside the pipe, pipelines. Uh, part of our development also was to establish or to form our own leak detection training facility. So this was constructed uh, in 2010. And then because of continuous improvement in 27, we automated this facility. So uh, this is uh, the venue where we conduct continuous training of our personnel and where we also on occasion accommodate trainings from outside our, uh, uh, outside our company. So this is moving on to the technologies and the measures we adopted uh, aligned with our integrated meter management approach. So in 2007, we initially started off with 23 different brands of water meter. So they, many of these water meters were really very old and were not replaced for more than 10 years. And uh, of course you can see because of the 23 brands, uh, our priority back then was really uh, when we procured meters, the, the, main, the main reason was compliance to the minimum requirements, uh, but the main driver was really the cost. 
So uh, we had to rethink our approach uh, or our appreciation of the meter because uh, as many times mentioned, maybe in other seminars, these are the cash registers of the company. So we had to make sure that these are performing always uh, at the highest possible level. So we started off again uh, with 23 brands of water meter. Over time, I think we've limited that to just five competent or five well-performing meters. So initially that was what we worked on. Uh, and part of the process was to uh, adopt uh, advancement in meter technologies. So we shifted to new meters uh, from just the normal velocity type, eventually moving on to volumetric meter. Um, admittedly, initially, uh, especially in 2013, 2015, uh, we couldn't move on directly to the volumetric type of meters because of the cost difference. But as time moved on, as we procured more, we saw uh, uh, very good changes or significant changes in the market wherein uh, volumetric and velocity type meters over time uh, almost uh, had the similar cost already. So that was beneficial for us. So we were able to transition. And right now, we're really moving on to adopting uh, majority of our meters having uh, are being uh, volumetric instead of the velocity because of really very significant advantages. Uh, part of the development that we did as well, uh, we did an internal development to come up with an on-site meter testing apparatus so we did this in-house. Uh, we purchased the most of, of the fittings and equipments locally. And then we were able to distribute this to our technical personnel on the field. So uh, on-site, they're able to conduct meter inspection or uh, accuracy and quality tests on the meter uh, so that, that they don't have to bring all of the meter that needed to be tested on, uh, on our laboratories. Related to meter testing uh, laboratories, we now have, uh, we have one now in Pasay uh, in our south area, but within the year, we expect to also complete the second one in the north. So our, our, our first uh, meter testing facility is already ISO certified. Uh, we also have a local uh, accreditation, the Philippine Accreditation Board uh, for our facility, which enable us to do in-house testing uh, of the meters uh, so that we can better select and identify which meters uh, were really compliant to our requirements. Uh, right now, we're also catering to uh, testing from outside the company, so we're able to assist uh, other, other, uh, other companies right now as we take on uh, some of their meter testing requests. Uh, part of the process or systems we adopted that we adopted includes having uh, a comprehensive data management system. So uh, considering that uh, data needed for NRW, NRW analysis and NRW operations actually is sourced from different sources, it comes from different corporate access. So uh, we had to make sure that uh, eventually we were able to integrate it. So part of uh, the requirement for that is to have uh, all the supply measurement from our DMAs, from our gauging points, uh, be carried on to our internal uh, servers so that they, consolid they are consolidated there. So uh, to be able to uh, pursue that, we adopted an automated data transmission system that captures all the information, all the supply readings from the different locations, the 1,600 locations spread across our network, and uh, bring them into our servers so that we can uh, easily consolidate them. Uh, so uh, again, that's part of the uh, that's part of the architecture that we had to build as we uh, conceptualized establishing a comprehensive NAW data management system. So this takes on uh, information. So supply comes the supply comes from the uh, automated supply collection system that we uh, covered earlier, and uh, we also get corporate information from our SAP to get the build volume. Uh, so that's when we're able to come up with NRW measurement uh, through the NRW data management system. So uh, other systems, uh, other corporate, uh, corporate systems adopted into this system includes access to GIS and uh, eventually access to our CMMS system. So we mo we're moving on slowly to that, toward that, that direction uh, because we have uh, our, our objective is to 
make uh, management of the, those 1,600 uh, DMAs easier for our operation team. So that uh, in just one click of a button, you have the reports, you're able to evaluate what the problems are, and you're able to uh, assess uh, what needs to be done. So those were the solutions that we've developed and we've worked on over the year, uh, allowing us to move forward, enabling us to share as well the expertise we've developed uh, in crafting solutions and services that we're able to share with other, uh, other companies outside of Manila. So these solutions and services developed by our ex experts and uh, as we, of course, partner with uh, other organizations as a Waterlink, ADB, of course, USAID, uh, and JICA, uh, we're able to cascade all the learnings we've, we've, we, uh, we've achieved and share them uh, to other utility operators. So some of the solutions and services that we've already, uh, that we were able to share so far uh, are the following. So we're doing twinning with uh, other water utility. This is uh, more of a uh, uh, partnership approach. So practitioner to pra practitioner exchanges of best practices. Uh, and then we also conduct feasibility studies and rapid NRW assessment. Uh, so these are quick assessment or quick evaluation of uh, uh, the NRW system of certain or specific networks or specific utilities. Uh, we also provide service such as leak detection and pipe inspection, uh, meter, uh, meter assessment and uh, recommendations to improve real reliability and accuracy of uh, meters as well as, of course, uh, various NRW trainings. So, so far, we've, we've done a lot, uh, both locally uh, and even internationally abroad. So these are just some of the uh, uh, locations or areas where we were able to provide our NRW services abroad. So part of that service, actually, uh, to focus on a few, uh, includes uh, NRW training for, for certain uh, water utilities. So a uh, couple in India and uh, one in Kenya and Africa. And uh, also uh, we, we provide NRW services as, as I mentioned earlier in terms of leak detection. So for this case, we partnered with uh, a leak detection uh, provider, a technology provider, PureTech, where we conducted leak inspection in India in 2013 uh, and another one in 2014. So moving on, uh, this is actually the last of my slide. So in closing, uh, aside from uh, NRW being able to improve access to safe and potable uh, water, it also ensures improvement and an increase in uh, operational efficiency translating to reduction in operate, uh, operating and maintenance costs. Uh, it also ensures that the customers, the people, uh, have better uh, access to uh, uh, water quality. And uh, at the same time, uh, an effective NRW management program allows us to delay any capital cost investment uh, or development of new water sources so uh, this enable us to focus our investment elsewhere that uh, where it's more appropriate, appropriate needed. Uh, that's the end of my presentation for this morning. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hamona, for the uh, presentation. So right now uh, it's uh, ten fifty-two in my time, so we still have about uh, thirty-eight minutes remaining on our uh, webinar for today. And now we have two questions in our Q and A box. So the first question is from Sanjay Joshi from our South Asia Department Operations. So his question, uh, Mr. Ryan, is NRW is now reached to twenty-six percent for Manila. So do you have any targets to further reduce it at a certain level, say less than 20%? And uh, have you done cost economics of further investment in leak reduction and the benefits? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, that's actually uh, a question that we normally encounter during these kinds of conferences. Uh, there are inter international standards that uh, defines uh, a certain economic level of leakage wherein any 
uh, additional investment will no longer be economical for a water utility operator. Uh, but developing that uh, ELL or the emerge, uh, economic level of leakage uh, will require significant effort and a lot of uh, information to be collected. Uh, at this point in time, uh, eh, our regulator actually in terms of our plan, uh, it's actually to initially just reduce it to 20%. So that in itself is already a bit challenging. So I guess uh, the answer is when we're able to already meet that level, when we're already uh, at that level, uh, we'll take it a next step further. And uh, that's when we, uh, part of our plan is to develop that economic level of leakage and make that assessment on whether it's still economical to reduce uh, the losses further down. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ryan. So for our next question, I think this is directed to Ms. Uh, Rodora Gamboa from Magdalene Water Academy. So this is from Roy Yuhu or Jason. Uh, his question is, I'm interested to learn more on the Water Academy as one of the part uh, or the part of the capacity building in the, in the long term. So can you share a bit more on the following? First is, how do you set the criteria for staff to attend the training in the academy? Second is the budget allocation for the entire annual training. And third is, how do you set the curriculum? Ms. Dora? Okay, thank you, Aldrin. Thank you uh, for that question. Uh, the Water Academy trainings are not uh, trainings that we do regular offerings for the public. Uh, Ms. Dora, can you speak uh, louder, please? Can you hear me now, yeah. Aldrin? Yes, 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 better. Okay. better. Okay. okay, so the Academy trainings are not a regular offerings, as I mentioned, uh, but it is more tailor fit to the client. So it depends on what the client needs, then we propose to them what is the more appropriate training program for the client. For example, if uh, the client wants a specific training, we propose to them that, that we do a training needs analysis first so that we will know who to train, what to train, and when to train. So it is more of tailor fitting the training program to them. As far as the budget allocation is concerned, it depends also on the on the training programs and the length of the training program that uh, we will conduct for them. Uh, as far as the curriculum is concerned, we have a set of curriculum already available, but there are uh, requests from other clients in which we don't have a module yet that we develop it for them. The whole Manila team in uh, the whole Manila complement is part of the academy helping develop the modules, helping deliver all the, the modules in which uh, this has been very effective for the past uh, for the past years. And now if and when there are programs in which the expertise of Maidila, there's no expertise in Maidila, then we get uh, we have partners in, in the Philippines who will help us deliver the program uh, for them. So it is, um, I think what I'm saying is that it really depends on the need of the client. I hope I answered your question, uh, Roy uh, Ms. Dora, with regards to the budget, can you give an indicative, I want to say, for a typical uh, uh, training that you set? Um, if it's based to, um, I really cannot say now, uh, Aldrin, because there are trainings that will require only lectures. There are trainings that needs field visits. There are trainings that just there is just a webinar. So it's not. Um, it really depends. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Dora. So Jason, also to uh, just to add. So if you, uh, we have the annual trainings that we have in the uh, in urban sector group with Manila, but uh, also as. Uh, you can also directly engage with them in case you have specific trainings that you want for your client DMCs or counterparts in our DMC. So they can uh, do a much better uh, trainings that are fit for their needs. So, yeah. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, Ms. Dora. Yeah, we have, I, I just would like to add, um, uh, Aldrin, that uh, what we wanted to do is not just training, but really capacitating the staff. It's not a one-time, it's not just a one-time deal. We wanted to really see that there is an outcome of the training program that we conduct for them. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Laura. 
Okay, so our next question is from uh, Hikaru Shoji from, from South Asia Department. So his question is, um, Mr. Ryan, given that exact location of pipes and their interconnections are often not known, uh, in existing systems, how were DMAs established? And then what were the challenges and the time it took to understand the whole uh, pipe or network system? And then uh, the last is, are DMAs physically isolated from each other, which will probably require significant change to the distribution system you took over, or there are interconnections between DMAs, but water balance is accurately measured by meters at strategic locations. Mr. Ryan, please. Yeah, uh, so there are several components to that question. Uh, first, uh, let's qualify DMAs uh, ideally are physically isolated from each other. So whenever possible, uh, it's advisable that they're independent. Uh, but there are occasion in our case, uh, because of the size, wherein we refer to them, we have series DMAs, wherein one, uh, the outflow of one DMA is actually the inflow of another. So there are occasions where, wherein that can be avoided, so it's correct. Uh, you, on those occasions, you have to make sure that they're uh, measured so that when you run the water balance, uh, you have a better assessment of what the situation is. Uh, so how were the DMAs established? Because you're correct, uh, especially when we took over, uh, most of the information on the pipe network were not really readily available uh, because the aged pipe, the, 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 the plants were not uh, readily provided uh, to our team who were doing the safekeeping, safekeeping of the information. So uh, how were the DMAs established? Uh, painstakingly, they were established over a period, I think roughly about 10 years. It took us 10 years to completely establish the DMAs in the entire pipe network. So uh, yes, part of the challenge was to look for uh, interconnection points or even isolation valves. So we had to, we had to uh, do a lot of excavation works uh, as part of that requirement uh, that enabled us to make that those isolation. So it was really very challenging. Uh, and at the same time, while we were doing that, as I mentioned earlier, we weren't just establishing DMAs. We actually wanted to establish or align it with our program in terms of pressure management or pressure managed areas. So that's part of the consideration, uh, wherein when you establish DMAs, it's better to look at it in the long term. So it, it may be a bit more challenging when you add those factors in, but in the long term, uh, it's more beneficial uh, when you get to the output. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ryan, for, <clears throat> for the answers to those series of questions on establishment of DMA. And uh, also, the, I think that our next session will actually be on DMA management. So the, if you have, uh, I think these questions will be more given uh, specific more in, uh, answers or enlightenment, or will be even more enlightenment in the next session that we will have. So, so thank you again. So next question is from uh, Terry. Uh, my colleague Terry Cho from uh, SDSC or so his question is what type of contract uh, do you use to hire for uh, your contractors so have you that other question is have you had, have we ever tried to use uh, modalities such as performance based contract and, and if ever you have you did what are the your experiences what are the pros and cons uh, Mr. Ryan thank you uh, we haven't had a chance to do a performance-based contract uh, specific to NRW management. Uh, in terms of how we procured or how we uh, acquired or engaged contractors, uh, we use a simple service agreement contract where we have the project bidded out, uh, where we establish unit quantities, and then the contractors who want to participate will just put in the price there. So uh, what they need is to be able to just deliver on, on the quantities specified in those type of contracts. Uh, so that's a fairly simple contract. Uh, why have we not delved into performance-based contract? I think that was part of our initial discussion when at the early stage of uh, the, the development of the NRW management program and the NRW management team. Uh, that was a consideration. I think, uh, at least for me, one of the reasons why uh, we were not exactly uh, keen on that, although there are different as you mentioned, there are different approaches to performance-based contract. Uh, I think one of the apprehension, uh, uh, one of our apprehension back then was that 
uh, we wanted first to make sure that whatever we implemented, uh, that there was ownership and that it was going to be sustainable. So it means that the competency would really have to be developed in-house. So I think that's part of the challenge when you look at performance-based contract. You transfer most or at least significant component of what you have to do to the contractor and then ask them to deliver uh, based on specific parameters. So uh, in those terms, uh, there are opportunities wherein you'd be able to miss, in, uh, miss the development of certain competencies inside your organization. So I think we were very keen on that, uh, looking forward and looking at the size of our organization. So part of our consideration in the long term was really to ensure that we uh, had a sustainable project or program in place. So as much as possible, really, we wanted to do everything in-house. And although we explored the possibility of performance-based contract, there were certain aspects of it that weren't uh, exactly attractive to us uh, back then. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Ryan. So our next question is from uh, uh, Amy Hampel. So she typed in the question. Thank you for insight for your insightful presentation. It shows that uh, capital investments go hand in hand with capacity building and institutional reform. Also agree that water utilities have to consider the trade-off between the cost of further reducing NRW against its benefits. Distinguishing between commercial loss and technical loss is difficult. May I ask how my uh maybe navigated this? Yeah. Uh, initially, in terms of baselining, there are two approaches. We talk about water balance, uh, top down, and the bottom up approach. So, if if you don't have a background in that, there's actually a lot of materials that covers that that discusses that. Uh, now, specifically to the case of Manila, what we found to be more effective, or what we found to be effective, is really doing it at the DMA level. So when you're doing it at the DMA level, you have lesser network and lesser number of accounts uh, to go through and analyze. So it becomes, uh, it becomes more easier. Uh, technically, there's an approach called the bottom-up assessment of the DMA, wherein uh, you, have, you, measure the, uh, you measure the total flow and the night flow. You do night consumption reading, and then you use a form formula. There's an, actually an automated process on this where you just have to key in information of pressure, flow, and night feeding. And then you'll get an output of what the commercial or what the potential commercial losses are. The concept really is that during night, uh, majority of the losses in the network because, of course, consumers, including illegal consumers or, uh, or those who undertakes fraud, are also not using. So the concept is that then at night, when you measure the flow at night, majority of those will actually just come from leak. So when you do the model, you profile that, uh, you profile that, you profile that leak, match it against your total flow for the day, and then you have an estimate of what the commercial losses is. That's another technical approach on how to do it. Uh, there are several other, there are several other approaches on how you'd be able to make that distinction. But but uh, the easiest way is really to approach it on a DMA level. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. So for those who have asked questions, if you have follow-up questions, you can ju uh, just type them in the Q&A box. So we have uh, another question from uh, Mr. Bao Cheng Seng from our PRC office, our PRC resident mission. So the this is kind of related. It's sort of a follow-up to Mr. Sanjay's question. So the NR, NRW decreased from 26% uh, to 66% through eight methods, which are mentioned. So the question is, have you made an, an analysis on the contribution of each method and which one is the most effect effective? Uh, NRW approach, actually, we talk about uh, those eight methods. Actually, there's, there's, there's more of that. All, those are just the key, key uh, eight programs that we've adopted. Uh, in terms of contribution, it's actually quite quite difficult to make that distinction because in terms of our approach, we had to do them uh, we had to do it, them in parallel or hand in hand. So as I mentioned, when we were doing DMA establishment, we were already aligning it to the pressure managed area, uh, as well as making use of hydraulic simulation, etc. Uh, I guess in terms of uh, contribution, what you can really just take out 
from all of it or easily easily account for is the contribution of uh, the pipe replacement uh, program uh, because all the rest uh, are are working hand in hand or are are done sim almost simultaneously so when when if you ask me to make that distinction now between those seven programs and the contribution of the pipe replacement program uh, i haven't technically made that assessment yet, a rough estimate would be something between 20 to 30% contribution of the selective pipe replacement. And then the rest really is more on adopting those uh, other eight measures, which also guarantees and ensures sustainability of the program. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ryan, for the uh, answer. So next question is from Mr. Nore Saito, who is our uh, Director of South uh, Asia Urban and Water Division. So. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. His question is, was this NRW reduction mostly done in-house? And uh, did you use a large team of consultants to advise you at least during the initial period of your NRW uh, management program? Yeah, uh, actually we did. Uh, especially in the first five years of uh, when we started off because uh, What's not mentioned earlier is that when the new owners took over, uh, the new operators took over, uh, there wasn't actually an NRW organization or a central NRW division. It was newly formed. So majority of the engineers or the personnel working on NRW for that division under our division was really newly hired. So we had to make a lot of uh, uh, we had to make a lot of programs to develop the competency uh, in terms of uh, knowing how to use the technology, uh, knowing how to approach the problems, and uh, taking on best practices again from uh, uh, other uh, other utility operators. So the first five years was really filled with a uh, number of different experts coming in from 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 abroad. Uh, so we had a partner engaged uh, that time who facilitated that. Uh, Mia actually. Uh, who helped us uh, bring in international experts to, turn, uh, to, to, to train our people. So that's a very critical component uh, of the success of the NRW management program is to make sure that you have that competency. Again, we were building on the future. We were looking at really making the program sustainable. Uh, so part of the answer to your question is yes, majority of the things we did were done in-house, specifically the, the assessment, the diagnostic work, and the maintenance work were done in-house. So uh, we, we only outsource uh, civil works, uh, uh, civil works component of the program. So those are the things that we outsource. So Mr. Ryan, am I correct? For about, uh, there was some sort of a, uh, we can say hand-holding for about five years before yes. my need was able to really develop its own team of NRW, say NRW experts in-house. Yes, Adrian, that was a process, actually. So uh, we've seen significant improvement in the first two or three years, but the next two years to complete the five years was also critical to make sure that the program and even instit institutionalizing the, the training modules uh, working with Water Academy were properly in place. Okay, thank you. So the next is, actually, this is not a question, but I think... Uh... Uh, it's a compliment from Kiyoshi Nakamitsu, our colleague from Central West Urban and Water Division. So Dora and Ryan, thanks. And uh, I think he has also a suggestion here. So welcome uh, uh, the Manila Academy that goes beyond capacity development, the things you're doing. So our clients in Pakistan still highly appreciate the tailor-made course made for their project team and uh, that is reflected whatever that is learned, including NRU W management into their project designs. So they were able to apply the learning. So the suggestion is my need to go into international market as Manila Water appears to be doing more in Middle East and Southeast Asia. Okay, so I think Mr. Ryan, you just maybe you can just maybe uh, repeat. You you mentioned some international uh, 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 initiatives you've done in NRW. Maybe you can repeat on those. Uh, are, are are these uh, suggestions from uh, suggestion rather from Kiyoshi? Is, is it? Already part of this suggestion, uh, can you clarify maybe? Uh, I'm not sure about the details of what the questions were asking, but in terms of just the general approach uh, specific to NRW and how uh, we we provided services outside, uh, 
we've done a lot of trainings, a lot of training activities internationally. Uh, so again, capacity building. Uh, we we develop modules uh, dedicated towards building capacity for other water utility operators to have a better approach or to have their uh, for them enabling them to develop uh, their own NRW programs. So those are tailor fit activities. Uh, to that extent, Adrian. Uh, we 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 have worked outside. We have worked internationally, and even partnering with uh, uh, other suppliers, uh, as, as seen earlier, uh, because our operators, our leak detection operators, are recognized as some of the world's best because of just the the size or the amount or the length of the network they've inspected. So we're being tapped as well to partner with other suppliers to 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 engage on those types of services abroad. Uh, that right now, that's the extent of the services that we 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 have provided so far. Uh, maybe we can get back to you, or maybe uh, if you have specific uh, specific details in mind in terms of what other engagement uh, uh, can be uh, can be implemented, uh, maybe we can we can discuss that uh, on a different uh, uh, on a different time and go into it more detailed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ryan. So we have here from uh, anonymous attendee, it says here. So thank you very much for an informative and engaging presentation. And uh, he, uh, he or she has some clarifications. First is how much of uh, NRW in the Manila Waters experience was addressed by community education and outreach? And then uh, follows up with uh, is social engagement an effective or efficient approach to NRW? And uh, with the presence of your center of excellence, do uh, do we know if NRW in Metro Manila and perhaps the country more broadly is improving significantly in reflecting uh, this in in country capacity? Yeah. Uh, so are there are different facets to that question, Adrian. Uh, let me just uh, at least take on uh, some of the, the points that we raised. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, in terms of community engagement, uh, in terms of being able to measure that. So again, that's another measure to, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a difficult uh, thing to measure uh, in terms of contribution, but we have done that. We found that it's in fact very critical in terms of uh, being able to engage the communities. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, we had problems in leak repair. Take for example, we had to secure five six different for permits from different gover government units. So we had to make sure that there's, a, there's that engagement, at least on those level, uh, so that they understand exactly what we were doing. Uh, with that appreciation, of what, with that understanding of what uh, we meant to do with uh, doing leak repairs, so what we wanted to achieve, we were able to get the, the, the permits faster. So that allowed us to resolve the leaks uh, faster. So talking about community engagement or stakeholder engagement, that's really a critical aspect of what, of what needs to be done to be able to uh, make sure that the program is successful. Uh, there's also the education in terms of the community because we wanted uh, people or our customers to report leaks because as they report leaks, we're able to attend to them faster. So there's also that aspect of communication. Uh, I think it's more prominent now because you can see even our, in, in, in our social media pages, we encourage our customers to really be engaged and report those leaks to us so that we can address them faster. So that's, uh, uh, thank you for pointing that out. That's not part of the component that I've covered. I covered mostly technical aspects of it, but to be, to be, um, to be honest and to be fair, uh, yes, that's a critical component of, of why uh, the program was successful there because there was uh, that degree of engagement. Uh, now, I'm not sure if I understood the second or the third question properly, but I think it refers to uh, the success or, or at least what we've achieved in Metro Manila. How does it compare to the situation uh, for the rest of the country? Uh, I think at this point, Dora would be in a better position to, to discuss this. I've actually experienced quite a few where it was both thrilling and both uh, eye-opening for me, wherein I saw a lot of opportunities really to be able to share uh, what we've learned uh, to other uh, to other water utility operators in the country, but uh, that was from maybe four or five years ago. I think if maybe Dora is still here, maybe uh, she can expound on this more. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Ryan. So if I may uh, expound on this on this um, question, in terms of NRW in the country, uh, 
the water service providers in the country, actually 24% of that are water districts and about 25 are private operators. So 24% for the water districts, the NRW 2009 on the average is 31%. Mm -hmm. And right now on the average, it is already 29%. So from 31 is 29, and it is still going down. The reason being, it is already being part of their KPIs that the NRW should be at least 25%. So it is slowly but surely going down. Unlike, you know, uh, in Manila, it was really a drastic um, you know, improvement in terms of NRW level. So uh, again, countrywide, NRW is um, improving, but it is slowly improving uh, in terms of the water districts uh, supply. For the LGUs, which is, which is also providing water supply in, in the country, that is the main challenge because not all LGUs even know what their NRW level is. So you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So that's the challenge uh, in the Philippines right now. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Dora. So I guess as a sort of... Uh, Maybe follow up to Mr. Ryan on this question of NRW. So we know that Mainila also has to just maintain a certain level of NRW because doing it, you know, uh, very low, say ten percent, five percent, would be very not be would not be cost effective, you know, on your part. So what would be the long term, say long term, the the optimum NRW uh, target of Manila, uh, maybe in, in the near in the near future. Uh, actually, uh, that goes back again to that uh, economic level of leakage uh, 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 indicator. Uh, so that's really the best way uh, to be able to de determine that uh, that level. Uh, Where in any any additional cost would already be uneconomical for the for the utility of for for my needs case for us. Uh, so at at present, uh, and this is broadly based on benchmark values, we're looking at twenty percent as the as the as the target objective. Uh, so. Uh, Predominantly, that's really based on benchmark figures that we've seen uh, locally and more so internationally. So uh, it's a process. Uh, so maybe if we're able to, to meet that already and we see that there's still that opportunity uh, to, to bring that NRW down without crossing the economic level of leakage threshold, then that's an opportunity for us to, to uh, lower, it, lower it further. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ryan. For that, I don't think we have uh, any more questions. Uh, oh, just a clarification. The anonymous attendee is actually Chingai Jaime from our environment uh, thematic group. Thank you, Chingai, for uh, that question. So, uh, so thank you again. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating uh, this morning in our uh, first or a series of webinars with my needed water on water utility operation basically dwelling on their success stories and lessons also and experiences from their transformation story uh, since the 90s and uh, how they have taken over the water utility management in metro manila on one concession side rather so again thank you very much to our speaker if there are no more questions uh thank you, again thank you very much to mr ryan hamora thank you for your time thank you for your presentation and for the insights you have provided to us on uh, manila's experiences and stories on nrw management and also to miss Dora Gamboa and his team, Bimbo and Oliver, thank you very much. And again, please uh, stand by for the announcements for the next two sessions on DMA management and wastewater management. We're still fixing up the time with the Manila water team on the avail availability of the speakers. Again, thank you very much and have a good day to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you, Edith. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.